Well, we're still in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and we're going to read the first four verses, but we're still in the first two verses about the race. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. <coughs> looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. With all of our stories in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we were in the role of spectators. Sunday morning I impressed this upon you, how throughout our study of the 11th chapter we sat in the wings, as it were, of the arena. We watched while men did battle for their lives. We observed the testimonies and the experiences of the Old Testament saints who have gone on before us. And now that we've passed through the 11th chapter, the Holy Spirit calls upon all of us to enter the arena and to become a contestant, not a spectator now, but to become a runner in the race, the race of faith. I'd like to tell you a few things about the race, things that I told you on Sunday morning as a matter of review so we'd have it in the background. The word in the original language for race is agana, which is the root of our word agony or agonize. So the very first thing we learn about the race is that it's a very difficult one. So difficult that only the word agony seems to describe it. This race of faith, this Christian life, the race that begins when we are born again and ends when we enter the 12th chapter in its close, Mount Zion, and that place where Jesus now lives, where the sprinkling of his blood is a very wonderful reality, where the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, will gather in that general assembly. This race begins when we are born again, when we are saved, and it doesn't end until we are ushered into the presence of God by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not running in order to see who gets to heaven. We're running in order to see how we get to heaven. We are assured of heaven when we are saved because our sins are forgiven us for Jesus' sake. This is the purpose of the cross. He died in our place and went to the cross for the judgment of God. He has made our sin and he carried our sins in his own body on the tree. And with his precious blood, he obtained what he and God his Father had long sought for, eternal redemption for all those who rest in the ransom of his own soul. So we're not running in order to be saved. and We're not running in order to find out when at the final judgment whether God has been pleased with the way we have run but we're running for the approval of the Lord Jesus. Running for the pleasure of the Lord Jesus and running for the glory of God. So the race is a very, very difficult race. Difficult because there are many obstacles and hindrances, some of them you'll hear tonight. Most of them are unknown to us. None of us have ever looked down the road of life and been able to tell what's ahead. If any of these in the 11th chapter had been able to see ahead, none would have run. But they ran by faith, knowing only what was behind, but not what was ahead. And this is one of the agonies of the race. It is run by faith. We're not permitted to see tomorrow, not allowed to look into next week. The race must be run today. And it must be won today, for we're racing against time, not against each other. We're not racing against another team. 
We are competing with time, racing against life. For the only time we have is now. And Jesus calls us now from the wings of the arena and it is our turn. The Old Testament saints are gone. They've run their race, won their rest, and now in the presence of the Lord Jesus become as spectators, compassing us about as a great cloud of many witnesses. And Jesus calls us now for the one opportunity that we have the one privilege that belongs to us to take our lives and use them for the glory of God, for the pleasure of the Lord Jesus, and for the eternal joy that will be ours in having something to lay at his blessed feet. So this race is one which all of us must run. There's no such thing as a Christian who does not run in this race. All must run. The race is set before us. We are in the arena the moment that we are saved and we begin our running the very day that Jesus becomes our Savior. And we run until the day that we see Him at the end of the race. There are weights that must be laid aside. Everything in life must be decided from this standpoint. Is it a weight or is it a wing? Will it help me to run or will it hinder me? Will it hold me back or will it speed me on my way? And if you discover that there is something in your heart or something in your life that's holding you back, weighting you down, the Word of God says that we must lay it aside. And the Word of God says that we can lay it aside. Because if we do not lay it aside, the sin, here referred to as a single sin, a sin that obviously the writer expects us to know about, and which I believe to be the sin of unbelief, this sin of unbelief will overtake us. And if it overtakes us, then we will be definitely hindered in our running. For this race must be won and run by faith. So in the race, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, we must run with patience. And my conclusion today, as I was studying this passage, is that we need all the help we can get. You agree to that? We need all the help that we can get. So I want to tell you about some of the help that's available to us tonight. First of all, I want to talk to you about the witnesses. Paul tells us in the first verse, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. And then we go on to read the story of Jesus, which we will hear about on Sunday morning. This word compassed about means just exactly that. The Greek brings out how the believer is ringed about with the witnesses of old. And they're likened to the spectators who once filled row after row and tier after tier of empty seats in the arenas of Rome. Some of these arenas were vast. I was reading one of the greater ones, ultimately seating 385,000 people. And from the royal box, which was down nearest to the arena, where the Caesar and his party were always seated, to the very highest tier, every seat filled, and many of them filled days in advance of the games, all waiting and watching for this glorious spectacle, the Olympiad, four years between each Olympiad, and here in this very arena, thousands are about to die. When they come from the wings to become contestants, their first performance was to stand before the Caesar and his royal party and say, we that are about to die, salute thee. And then the games. And the loser died. The winner lived. To wear the wreath and to wear the crown to enjoy the sweet fruits of victory, become national heroes, as all of them did. Now Paul brings this picture before us, I am sure, in these words that are employed here, because I can't find any place else to put these witnesses that compass us about. They have to be heavenly spectators. 
They have to be other than those who are in the contest. And we are in the contest and all believers are in the contest. Well, I'm sure that among the spectators there's also the world, unsaved, that watches while we run, not understanding why we run, but also we are being watched by heavenly spectators. And I've often wondered, and I wish I knew more about it, what influence they may have upon each of our lives unknown to us. And I've often wondered what not only influence but power they may exert upon us from their place as spectators in the presence of the Lord Jesus. It's fun to think about. When Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration or the Mount of Olives, and there he transfigured himself before his disciples, Peter, James, and John, while they witnessed the glory of the Lord Jesus, brighter than the sun in its strength at noonday, they were suddenly aware that he was not alone standing on either hand of the Lord was another person identified as Moses and Elijah and as Peter James and John listened and observed they noticed that Moses and Elijah and Jesus were engaged in conversation and they were talking with the Lord about his death that was soon to become history in the city of Jerusalem and you remember how impressed these three men were by these heavenly spectators. And immediately they wanted to build uh, tabernacles for each of them. But they heard a voice which came from the glory, and the voice said that this was not to be, that the glory and the honor belonged to him. And so they came down from that mountain, seeing no man save Jesus only. But the spectators were there, and they were with the Lord. They were in the presence of the Lord Jesus and they were seen for at least a brief moment by Peter, James, and John. And I've often wondered, you know, exactly what their influence is upon my life and yours. What they say and do we hear what they say and what their purpose is and what their function is. How much contact do they make with us in this life? Well, you see that all who have fallen asleep are in Christ. And having to fallen asleep in Him and fallen asleep by him. Those of us who are in contact with him are also in a measure in contact with them. We who are in fellowship with him are in a measure also in fellowship with them. And I've had this experience just once or twice, but at least enough to know is real, that my brothers and sisters who fall asleep in Jesus often seem nearer, closer, the fellowship more real and precious, after departing this life than before. Assured that they're in the Lord, assured that they're now in Him whom we already know and love, seems like it's their fellowship and their presence is so much real, so very much real. But the spectators are here. I don't want to tell fairy tales or say mysterious things, but... <laughs> Often while preaching, especially as I told you Sunday morning from the epistles of Paul, it seemed to me at times that Paul himself were here. It makes me nervous whenever I imagine that he's present. He doesn't seem to be out there, he seems to be here. And he's saying, be careful now how you rightly divide what I've written. Take this opportunity, I've heard him say many times. Declare with boldness the gospel is committed to you. Often these saints, by their testimonies, influence us. By the memories which they left behind, spur us on. Many a saint of God has been lifted up and started again in the road of life by the remembrance of those whose race has already been won, by looking back upon the valiant faith which they expressed and exercised. How many times we've wept with Elijah under his juniper tree, and how many times we've been encouraged to go on 40 days and nights when we realize that the angels who ministered to him could also minister to us. How often we've shared the experiences of these saints and the sharing of their experience has encouraged us. We're reminded by the Holy Spirit that Elijah, probably the greatest prophet outside of Moses in all of the Old Testament, 
The Holy Spirit reminds us that Elijah was a man of like passion. He was a man of dust, a man of flesh. I've been encouraged many times to know that Elijah was no greater man than me in his natural state. So the spectators have to be with us. I'm positive that they're with us. I don't know whether they cheer us or whether they give advice or what they do, but they're with us and they observe us. Now, when the boys were playing football, I couldn't keep still when I was standing on the sidelines. I was only a spectator, but I was always yelling things. <laughs> keep your head up. And I wonder often if these people are not cheering us too. I've been cheered many times when I couldn't find the source of the cheering. I've been encouraged many times when I couldn't lay my hand on the source of the encouragement. I've been lifted up many times when I couldn't see the hands that lifted me. And Paul doesn't speak of these people who ran their race in Hebrews 11 as being far away and unconcerned with what we're doing. He speaks of them as watching us. We are compassed about. The Greek says we are ringed about all around us. Is this great cloud, one huge mass of witnesses, men who have testified to the ability to win the race if we desire. For this is what we learned in the 11th chapter. Look over the, the characters in that chapter. Tremendous difference in these people. Yet each of them in their own way ran the race that was set before them and they made it. <coughs> Consider, for instance, in the first man introduced in this 11th chapter, Abel, the great weight that Abel had to lay aside in order to run. Think of the sin of unbelief that had to be laid at the feet of the Lord for Abel to take the first thing of his flock when he knew the cost would be not only the loss of his life, but the loss of his brother for eternity. Think of how much Enoch had to put aside to walk with God. Think how many weights he had to lay off, how much sin he had to confess, and how diligent he had to be to walk in the presence of God. And then think of Noah. Think of how much he left behind. Think of the weights which he had to put aside to flee to the ark for safety. And then think of Abraham, who was a man just like us, who laid aside the weight of his own home, his own father and mother, ultimately his own wife, his own child by Hagar, and many, many other things in his life precious to him. He laid them aside as weights that held him back and hindered him, confessing the sin of unbelief that made him to hold on to them so long and ran with patience the race that was set before him. Think of Moses who laid aside the weight of the entire Egyptian court. The wealth, the riches, the allurement of that society, Think of all that he aspired to be and all the dreams that he pushed aside that he might go to the back side of the desert and run with patience the race that was set before him as a shepherd to be used ultimately in the hand of God. Think of Joshua who laid aside so many weights, his own conscious inability. He was so aware of his own weakness and his own inability to do what God had called him to do man who despaired when the mantle of Moses fell upon him, who was lifted up by God and told not to be afraid nor dismayed. But the power that had worked in Moses would work in Joshua. And he'd stand in the same office and do the same work. And think of Rahab, who laid aside all that she knew of life, the very city that was her home, friends, whatever, confessing the sin of her unbelief, held on to the scarlet rope of redemption and ran the race with patience. Well, that encourages me to think about spectators. If any of you spectators are here tonight, encourage us a little bit. Then think of the runners in the race, too. See, we don't run this race alone. We run with others. Over and over in this verse, we're told, we also must run. Us, 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 Paul says. We run 
together as believers in this race for the glory and for the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this bothers me a lot because since we run together in this race, we have certain responsibilities and certain obligations. Now if you've learned how to lay aside the weights and confess the sin of unbelief, then you must also learn that the running in this race involves others and entails others. Be careful not to cause others to stumble. Now when a racer stumbles, he falls. And when he falls, he's temporarily out of the race. And when he's temporarily out of the race, he also becomes a hindrance to others who race with him. And over and over in the New Testament, we are warned by the Holy Spirit not to put stumbling blocks in the paths of others. Now, Christians can cause others to stumble in the race. They can cause others to stumble in the race by, number one, being a stumbling block themselves, by placing a stumbling block in their way, and by being used of Satan in a snare that causes others to stumble. I'd like for you to turn to the 14th chapter of Romans. Let's look at one of these passages for a minute. Romans 14, the great chapter about our relationship with other Christians. I wish every believer not only knew what was in this chapter, but practiced it in his life. chapter has to do with doubtful things in the Christian life. There are many things in our lives that may be lawful for me, but not expedient. Now, there are many things that come in my life that there is no direct teaching in the Scripture for or against. You can't just open the Bible and find a verse that says, do this or don't do it. This chapter covers these doubtful things, the things which often we say belong to the realm of Christian liberty, where a man must stand or fall in the presence of the Lord Jesus alone because of the thing he allows. But what Paul warns about is judging others in these matters. It's a tremendous temptation to a believer uh, to face something not covered in the Scriptures and to pray about it in the presence of the Lord and at last arrive at some peaceful conclusion to the matter. It's a great temptation to him not to turn around and make that the law of life for every Christian he knows. And he reasons this way, if I had this thing come to, up to my life and I've asked the Lord and the Lord's led me this way and he's shown me that this is wrong, then it's necessarily wrong for you. But not necessarily true, according to this chapter. In fact, Paul teaches a very strange doctrine about it. He says that it's possible for one man to do the thing and do it as unto the Lord, and it's possible for another man not to do it and not to do it as unto the Lord. So it's possible that two Christians could be disagreed on whether the thing is right or not and still both be right in the sight of God. That's weird. Because we're too used to putting things in the right or the wrong side of our lives, saying this is right and this is wrong. So Paul warns about this, and of course the case that was tested so often in the first century was the meat which was offered to idols. There was so much uh, demon worship in Paul's day, idol worship. And uh, meat sacrifices were offered to these demons, to these idols. And they were not allowed to be consumed by the worshippers at all. Fresh meat was placed upon the altar, and when the, the ritual of sacrifice was over, the fresh meat was taken out in the alley and sold in the shambles. And the question soon came up in the lives of the early Christians, is it right for a believer to eat such meat as that, knowing full well in his heart that this meat has been dedicated to demon spirits? Knowing full well in his heart that this meat is unclean in the sight of God? And so it seemed like a whole Christian community chose sides. And this group over here and said, no, it's not right, and no Christian should ever touch that meat. And this side over here said, we don't see it that way. We believe that if our heart is right toward God, we can eat the meat just the same as those over here can't eat the meat. We believe if we thank God for what He's provided for us and accept it as a gift from Him, it's untainted and, un and untouched and it's clean in the sight of God. 
brings us to a very precious and wonderful thing, and that is that the Christian life is not run by rules and regulations. It's a relationship between us and between the Lord Jesus. And all questions in our lives are ultimately solved by Him and settled by Him. They don't really concern the rest of us. I've often been asked, you know, is this right to do as a Christian? Should a Christian do this? Should he go here? Should he be seen in this kind of place? Or should he partake of this particular type of thing? And when people ask these questions, they're asking to be put back on the law. They want a rule. They want a regulation. They want a law, a commandment. So they really want to serve the law instead of serving the Lord Jesus. But we're not under law. We're under grace. So generally speaking, my answer is always the same. Did you ask Jesus? You don't need a lawyer. You need to talk to Jesus. What did Jesus say? As one young girl told me, I wouldn't even ask him about it. Well, then don't ask me. And if you can't ask him about it, does that tell you anything? If you're so sure it's right, then talk to him about it and see what he says. And I'll tell you this much, that anything he tells you you can do will be all right with me. That doesn't necessarily make it right for me, because I will have to ask him too, and I've asked him many things, now, have him tell me no when I see that he tells you yes. So Paul, in this, in this great chapter, really a great chapter about our relationship with other Christians, reminds us in the 10th verse, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, Every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give a ledger account, so the Greek says, like that of a bookkeeper, of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Verse 21 says, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Well, this certainly does something to the man's argument. It's always saying, I can live as I please. It doesn't make any difference how I live or how I walk. My life is my own, and I must give an account to the Lord of myself. And that's what the passage teaches partially. First of all, it sets forth that great that great truth that we do answer personally to the Lord Jesus for our lives. I will never have to give an account for Bill Carter. I won't have to give an account for Mike or Henry. Jesus will never call me into his presence to say, now you must account for everything in John Jones's life. But I must give an alleged account to him for the way I've conducted my own life. And you must help me to run the way he shows me. You must help me to walk the way I know I must. I'm responsible for the light which he's given me. Not the light he's given you, but the light he's given me. And this is the light I must answer for when I'm in the presence of the Lord. And if you use the light that you have to bring me into darkness, then you will answer to Jesus. And if you use the liberty that you possess in this particular thing to bring me into bondage, then you must answer to him. For he will hold you responsible for stumbling me. He will make my fall your responsibility. And so whether we like it or not, we're running together in the race. And I not only have to be careful to run the way he shows me, I can't elbow you when you go by. I can't trip you when you're in my immediate area. 
I can't crowd you in this racetrack. I must do everything in my power to race as he has shown me and at the same time helping you in every way I can to run how Jesus has shown you. <coughs> and if I'm doing something that makes you weak, I've hurt you. If I'm doing something that offends you, then I've hurt you. And if I'm doing something that stumbles you, then certainly I've hurt you. And here we are taught that even though each of us must give an account to Jesus, we must also share the responsibility of those who race alongside of us. Now, if you look in 1 Corinthians, I think 8, we have a little more on this. <coughs> Same subject taken up. Meats, and whether it's right or wrong for the Christians of the first century to eat this particular kind of meat. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. I think that's a touching and powerfully moving passage. But Paul so felt the compassion and love of the saints. That as far as he was concerned, he would bypass this meat as long as the world stands, though he himself felt no condemnation whatever in his years. But he said, if it helps my brother to stumble, if it serves a destructive purpose in a weak Christian's life, if it makes bold a weak believer who can't cope with this matter in his conscience, then I have not only offended and stumbled him, I have wounded him and did not Christ die for him? Therefore, for Jesus' sake, I must be careful how I run, that I do not offend and cause to stumble others who are in this race. We need to check our lives. First John chapter 2, verse 10. There's another verse there that I like in this respect. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. First John 2.10. So here's a positive way we can help others in the race. Number one, the negative way. Don't put a stumbling block in his path. Don't hinder or interfere with him in his running. And number two, a positive way, abide, abide in the light. Jesus is the light. To abide in Jesus is to walk in fellowship with him. To walk in the light is to walk in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And if you do, you will never, never, never give anyone an occasion to stumble. So your own fellowship with the Lord is vitally connected to your relationship with other Christians. And so if you don't walk in fellowship with the Lord for your sake, walk in fellowship with the Lord for my sake. Because the way you walk will affect me. You walk in darkness, I may follow you and fall down. If you walk in the light, I may follow you and learn to abide in Christ myself. So if you don't want to cause others to stumble in a race, don't put a stumbling block in their way. And if you want to help us, all of us, abide in the light. Christ abides in you, now you abide in him. Walk in the presence of the Lord Jesus every day of your lives. Do what you do with his approval. Walk conscious of the fact that he's in your immediate presence. And you'll never cause anybody to stumble. I ever tell you the story about the 
men who were standing on the street corner. And uh, another man joined them, and when he joined the group, he looked all around and he said, Are there any women present? And one said, No, just Jesus, go ahead. And he never got his story told. Now, there's another way, there's another way that we can be involved and cause to hinder and offend and stumble another brother. Well, there's another way. Listen to this. First of all, the world and the flesh and the devil and other Christians all are used many times in our lives to put weights on us. Now, weights anything that holds us back. Anything that slows us up and hinders us. Anything that wears us out. Anything that discourages us. Anything that gets us down so we can't run. And the world and the flesh, who's better at it than the world, and the devil, as well as other Christians, will put every weight on us they can put on us. And the purpose of these weights is to hold us back just long enough or to discourage us just long enough or to slow us down just long enough so that the sin of unbelief can overtake us. Now, if you get enough weights, you're obviously not going to run very fast. And the slower you run, the more advantage the sin of, uh, of unbelief takes. And soon it overtakes you, and you quit running. And when you quit running, what do you do? You lay down and quit. Did you ever say you were too tired to run anymore? You say, I can't go on? You say, I'm too discouraged? There's no use. I can't win because there's too many things holding me back. I want to live for Jesus, but I can't. That's the sin of unbelief that's overtaken you, and you've laid down right square in the middle of this race and quit. And you know what will happen? Other runners will stumble over them. Now, this is different than putting a stumbling block in their path. You can keep on running and put a stumbling block in their path. Something you don't stumble over but make them stumble over. Now, here is the thing turned around where you yourself become the stumbling block. And whenever you accumulate so many weights that you can't run as you ought to run in this Christian race, and a sin of unbelief overtakes you and you lay down spiritually and quit and say, I'm too tired... Others will stumble over you. And you remember in the 21st chapter of John, Peter did just exactly this. One time I've been so interested in Simon Peter's life because I'm like Paul in some ways, but I'm more like Peter. Don't know anything. <laughs> Ignorant and unlearned and unlettered. I doubt if I could have been a successful fisherman. He was. But he and I share a lot together in that he was very, very, very impetuous, tremendously impatient, always talking when he should have been listening, and always said far more than he ever intended. He was the man that said, I will not, I will not, I will not, not ever, ever, ever will I ever, ever, ever deny the Lord. And before the rooster had played his song three times, Peter had done just exactly what he said he would not do. So I like this man because we have so much in common in our sins. But Peter was terribly discouraged, and I searched back in, in his life a little bit one time to find out what brought him to the decision of John 21 to go fishing. Well, he was discouraged. Doggone it. People get discouraged. And he was discouraged. Why? Well, he was... A, he had the same kind of a motor like I've got. It either runs 170 miles an hour or is dead zero. And uh, Peter was running on nervous energy all the way through Calvary and all the way through the resurrection. He'd been through a very, very, very traumatic experience. 24 hours before the cross, he had denied the very Lord he loved. The thing he had sworn with an oath he would never do, he now swore with an oath in doing and he got one big black picture of himself. Peter started looking within instead of to Jesus. 
How do you think he felt when he stood in the judgment hall and Jesus came out and looked at him? Well, I know how he felt because the scripture says that he went out and he wept openly, bitterly. Peter had gotten a good long look at what he was. He had nothing but failure to look upon, nothing but weakness to examine. The Lord is gone now from him. He can't even tell him he's sorry. He is without the obvious presence of the Lord. And obviously he's without the joy of the Lord for the moment. And certainly without the peace of the Lord. So one day he said to the disciples who were nearest to him, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Now, I'm not reading this into Scripture because it is in the grammar of the original language in Peter's confession to go fishing. He said this to his brothers. I've been thinking it over. I've been more than three years following Jesus. And I'm tired and I'm discouraged and I'm a failure anyway. And I look back and I see nothing but ruin. I've denied the Lord. I've said the things I said I would never say and done the things I said I would never do. And I'm going to go back to the fishing business. I'm going to quit being Christian. I'm going to get lost. I'm going to go back to the world I came from and I'm going to live for me. Just for a little while. That wouldn't have been so bad because I suppose about every minute of every day some Christian makes that announcement. But what was bad about it was that he, he caused five or six of his brothers to stumble because they said, if Peter can't make it, we can't make it either. If he can't go on, we can't go on either. If it's discouraged him, he, you know, was the chief of the apostles. He was the man that had been in Gethsemane with the Lord. He's the man that had been on the Mount of Transfiguration, had seen what the other disciples had not seen. He was the man who came early at the tomb, witnessed the resurrection, had conversation with heavenly visitors, heard about the ascension, ran on into Galilee to meet the Lord Jesus. And he was one of the men who in the upper room had seen him when he came and said, Peace, and displayed his wounds to them. And five or six of his brothers said, If Peter can't make it, I can't make it either. Well, it wasn't right for them to say that, but they said it. Because they said, We go with it. You may not think that others are influenced by what you do, but they very definitely are. And there are many other believers who are watching you and depending on you and leaning on you to the extent that if you said, I can't make it, they say, We can't make it either. When you lay down in the Christian race and quit, you can't help but cause those running close to you to fall over you. Oh, you may not affect those who are on the other side of the stadium, or on that past turn back there where you left them. But what about those who run with you? And you know, we do run together, don't we? We're running together as an assembly. You're running with me. What if I laid down and quit tonight? I told you I could never, ever, ever run again. And I never, never, never was going to try. And I was going to go back to the world where I came from and go live for me. Some of you would say, if he can't make it, I can't make it. And some of you go with me. And we'd be a miserable lot because we'd fish all night and we wouldn't even get a nibble. And when daylight came, we'd be in the same fix Peter was in, naked and tired and worn out, and so far removed from the presence of the Lord that we wouldn't even recognize his voice if he spoke to us because he stood a mere 300 feet away and called to them. They didn't even know him until somebody said, It's the Lord, and scared Peter to death, and he jumped overboard. I wonder if he just meant to drown himself. The Lord fished him out and brought him into the shore and made him stand in his presence and repeat not only what Jesus knew, but what Peter knew down in his heart. Lord, thou knowest all things, and thou knowest that I love thee. Now, I think Jesus dealt with Peter about his little fishing trip, don't you? 
But he dealt with it in a very mild way because what he said was, all right, then feed my sheep. What he'd been doing, why he'd been stumbling the sheep. Five or six had fallen over him. They had tripped over him. He had become the stumbling block that turned them aside from following Jesus. He had been charged with their responsibility. Feed these sheep, not destroy them. So you may put a stumbling block in somebody's path, but you may be the stumbling block yourself. You need to abide in Christ. Walk in fellowship with Jesus because if you don't keep laying aside whatever holds you back in this race for the approval of the Lord Jesus, the sin of unbelief is going to overtake you. And when it does, I'll tell you from experience, it'll get you down right in the road and you won't be able to get going. And if you get down, the people who run closest with you will fall over you. So, you know, watch out for me. <laughs> if you're not going to watch out for you, watch out for me. It hurts when you fall down, especially when you trip over something you don't expect to trip over and fall when you don't expect to fall. You, know, you say, I just quit and roll over to the side and get out of the way. It would be nice if you could do that, wouldn't it? But the trouble is that we're in the arena and the doors are all locked. There's no exits. And Jesus has the keys. You either run or you're in the way. Are you running with me? Am I running with you? Are we running with each other? Are you helping me? Am I helping you? How's the guy going to get up when he gets down? <laughs> well, there may be lots of fancy ways described in the church business. I've read many and many and many a track on how to get up when you get down. I was telling Lena coming to the meeting tonight, I said I read a lot of things yesterday. I picked up about everything I could get a hold of yesterday evening. And uh, it's really sad how meaningless most Christian counsel is when you're really down. Like, rejoice, brother. Here, suffering for the Lord's sake. Hip, hip, hooray. You ever read some of these little tracks when you're really down? Why, they're impossible. They're impossible. Because when you're down, it's because the sin of unbelief has overtaken you. And when the sin of unbelief overtakes you, it's pretty hard to believe anything when unbelief's got you down. So about all you can say is, I know. I know. Yes, I remember reading that. I'm sure that's true. I know it is. But to know it in the heart is something else. And so I really found that words won't get you up. But Jesus can get you up. He can send an angel to help you up. He can send a brother who may not give you any fancy advice, but a brother who can manifest the faith you so long to exercise. And you can believe because he believes. You ever do that? Sometimes I can believe you when I can't believe Jesus. I know it doesn't sound right. But I can believe you sometimes when I can't believe Jesus because I'm human. And when the sin of unbelief overtakes me, it's hard for me to sense that I'm in really touch with Jesus. He's so far away. But I can touch you. And if I can touch you, and you can tell me that you're in touch with Jesus, many times I can believe you. And believing you will help me to believe Him. I don't know. that make any sense? I can't always touch the bridegroom, but I can get a hold of the bride. I can't always touch the head, but I can always touch the body. And, conversely, Many times when the head cannot touch me, he touches me through the body. And he touches me through the bride. And after all, since he is, we learn in this text, the author and finisher of faith, then whether it's faith in me or faith in you, it's still that which he authors and finishes. And he's created faith in my heart many times through the faith in your heart. And I'm sure that he's created faith in your heart through the faith in mine from time to time. 
Now, our last look. Spectators are going to help us. And I hope the runners are going to help us. <laughs> At least don't make us fall down when we go by. <coughs> Run slowly if you want to, but take the outside lane. Stay out of this express lane. So the spectators are going to help us and the runners are going to help us. But most important of all is that Jesus is going to help us. Now, I know you hope I get that part. <laughs> because if you're like me, I don't have too much confidence in the traffic around me. <laughs> And I'm not so sure that I always hear what the spectators are saying. Sometimes they throw pop bottles and stuff. <laughs> but here, we are told that Jesus will help us, and we are exhorted to look to Jesus if we're having difficulties in this race. Now, in the original language, it doesn't just mean to see him or to stare at him. There's a twofold meaning in the word look, and it means to lift up, Lift up and look away too. So it means, number one, you must look away from whatever you're looking at and then look to the Lord Jesus himself. It's negative and it's positive both. Two sides to the sword. It implies then, if you're having difficulty in the race, it's because you're looking at something else in that place in your heart where you ought to be looking at Jesus. Now, if you laid down and quit, like I do many times, Jesus will show you what you've been looking at. And he will exhort you, as he exhorts me, to look away from that thing you're looking at and look to him. Look to him. Did you ever look at yourself? Mm. Bad, bad. Well, I mean, if you, if you can even get by the shock of your face, <laughs> it's bad, bad. Now, you know, over a period of years, you learn to accept your face. I mean, it's just kind of the thereness of it. You get up every morning, it's always there. It never looks any better. It seems to me it always looks worse. So you get to, get so you can live with your face. But do you know that you also walk in the Christian life sometimes in a manner that makes you forget what you are inside? And I... Oh, this is a doorway here. I don't want to go through this doorway because there's too much out there. But it's, Well, okay, well. I'm glad you asked me. The thing about Simon Peter this afternoon and how... Uh, Jesus came to him one day and he said, uh, Simon, Satan hath desired thee that he might sift thee. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, go and strengthen thy brethren. So what I got out of that was this. Satan's desire in Peter's life, whatever it was he wanted to do in Peter's life, he had to first of all discuss with Jesus. Because in the Greek, it brings out how this desire was expressed in counsel. So Jesus and Satan had a little conversation over Peter. And Satan expressed in the presence of the Lord what he wanted to do to Peter. What he wanted to do to his life. And I got secondly the fact that if it had been discussed with the Lord, then the Lord allowed it. And I got thirdly that if the Lord allowed it, if he allowed Satan to sift Peter, if he allowed him to put him in a place of special test, a place where Jesus knew ahead of time he would fail. For he did fail, did he not? How did Satan want to sift him? Why, he wanted to test him and make him deny the Lord, and he did. It don't seem like Jesus helped him any. But Jesus did help him. He first of all prayed for him that his faith would not fail and he gave him the promise while on the threshold of that test that he would be converted from this failure and that the purpose of it all was that in his conversion Jesus would use him to strengthen the brothers. Now that's kind of a little involved uh, type thing. 
But I think what really happened in Peter's life was allowed by the Lord to show Peter what kind of a man he was. Why, well, he, he had a mouth this big, 24-inch diagonal. And he was always using it. And everybody else was saying, I might do this. He said, I will never, I will never, I will never, I will never. I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. And I like Jesus' words to him in the 21st chapter of John just before he ascended. And he said to him, yeah, when you're old, men are going to bind you up and take you where you wouldn't go. Peter was always boasting about what he was going to do. And he had a certain amount of self-confidence and he had a certain amount of inflated ego. And you know, Peter was a man God used. And if God ever uses a man, it's not too hard for him to get out, you know, kind of strung out on that a little bit. Everybody thinks he's Superman. And every now and then, the Lord lets the devil show him he doesn't have any S on his undershirt. And I, I was trying to figure out today why, why Jesus would let Peter go out there and fail. He did. He failed. And Jesus knew beforehand that he would fail. But there's one thing Peter knew as he stood in the judgment hall that night. <laughs> that he'd run his mouth way too much. That he wasn't nearly as strong as he imagined himself to be. That apart from Jesus, he really couldn't do anything. And that he was just exactly what Jesus knew him to be all the time. A very, very needy, insecure, helpless man who must have Jesus if he makes it at all. So what Peter got a good look at in his failure was himself. And by the Sea of Tiberias, when Jesus said, Come and dine and feed my sheep, he quit looking at himself and he started looking at Jesus. And he got encouraged in the Christian race again and he began to run. And you know, if you read the, the epistles of Peter, First and Second Peter, written many years later after the Apostle Paul had come along and taught him in the doctrines of grace, he's as different as night is different from day as you find him in the book of Acts and in the Gospels. His boasting, his self-confidence, it's all gone and the epistles are just filled with the presence and the person and the glory of the Lord Jesus. Peter learning what John the Baptist prayed he would learn, what every one of us have to learn, that Jesus must increase and we must decrease. So, when you look to Jesus, you have to look away from whatever it is you're looking at. And if you get to looking to yourself, you fall down. Because to look to yourself, you've got to look in. And you get to looking down this way and try to run fast and you fall down. <laughs> there may be any kind of thing in your way and you just trip over and fall around your face. So you can't look in. If you want to get discouraged, look in. If you want to be dis disappointed, look to others. If you want to be encouraged, you'll have to look to Jesus. You know when you're looking at yourself. I know you can't quit it sometimes. It seems like a, 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 these attacks of spiritual insanity that come upon us when all we can see is ourselves have to run a course. And God allows them and always good comes out of them because I never came through one of those clouds in my life. I didn't know a little more about myself than I knew before. And it made me a little hesitant to walk as swiftly as I did before. So you know when you're looking at yourself now you've got to quit it positively, quit it negatively. You've got to turn it aside and you've got to look to Jesus and He will help you. And you can't be helped by the spectators. And when the runners aren't helping you, you just have to look to Jesus. And Jesus can do anything that anybody else has failed to do and anything that needs to be done in your life. You can't look to others. You can't pay attention to the way I run. You shouldn't. You have your own race to run. You get to staring over at me and you'll fall down again. Because you know what will happen if you get to watching me run? Well, you'll begin to analyze my style. And you'll say, well, he runs that way. Why can't I run this way? Now, you're supposed to run the way Jesus shows you to run, in the way that's natural to you, in the way that's best for you. But don't pay attention to the way I run, unless I stumble you or get in your way. Don't look too much to the spectators, because you, you, you can't do like some of these 
screwball horses become stargazers. You can't go along like this. If you do, you fall down. Don't stare too much at the spectators, and above all, don't listen too much to what the world says as you go by. What you need to do then is what I'm telling you is to concentrate keeping your eyes and your affections and your heart of hearts set upon Jesus first. You've got to keep looking to Him. And you look to Jesus and whatever grace you need to lay aside the, the weights that are keeping you back and whatever help you need to confess the sin of unbelief that has overtaken you, and whatever strength you need to run and whatever grace and whatever patience is necessary, Jesus is going to provide it for you. I can't wait till Sunday morning. This is a commercial. Because Sunday morning, we're going to talk about the greatest hero of faith of them all, and that was Jesus himself. I'm going to show you how he ran his race and what he had to endure, how different his race was than ours, how much more difficult it was than ours. Why, well, he sacrificed the joy that was set before him and chose the cross. And God asks us to keep our eyes on the joy that's set before us and endure the present cross. But look to Jesus because he is the author and finisher of faith. Not author and finisher of the Christian faith, not author and finisher of our faith as such, but author and finisher of all faith. Now, how does that encourage me? Well, Peter or Paul writes it in Philippians 1 6, He that hath begun a good work in you will continue to perform it even until the day of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus begins faith in you, he's going to complete it. And all you have to do is look back and ask yourself whether you ever did have any faith. You did believe. When you get down and out on the road, you can look back and say, I know I believed yesterday. I know I believed the day before. I know there was a time that faith was present in my heart even though I can't see it now. Well, it's still there. He began that faith and He's going to complete it. He's going to finish it. There may be times when you're not aware of that faith, but it's there. I learned this last spring. And I could just let down and let go, lay down and quit. I wasn't going to go anywhere, but... There was going to come a day when I was going to believe more than I'd ever believed in my life, and I did. He's the author and he's the finisher of this faith. He allowed Peter to be sifted. He allowed him to get down in the Christian race. Peter's faith never did fail. Peter didn't enjoy it for a little while, but there was a day when faith revived in him, and my, didn't Peter believe again? It wasn't that he got new faith, it was faith that had not failed, still at work in him. Okay. And there's a strange and divine principle at work in this looking to Jesus because you know, only look one direction at the same time, but one time, you know, unless you're cross-eyed. But you, you have to focus in one direction only. And every time you really, truly look to Jesus you do really and truly lose interest in everything else. Don't you now? What does it matter if I can see Jesus? What do the problems matter or the interference by the other runners or the stumbling blocks or the hindrances and the weights? What does really matter if I can see Him? Well, we have a song something about that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow what? Strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. You know, when you look to Jesus, there isn't anything else matters. Remember when these men were on the Mount of Transfiguration and uh, they got all hepped up because they saw Moses and Elijah and they had a little conference and they said, let's build three church buildings. We call one the first church of Moses and the other one the first church of Elijah. And one of the other disciples spoke up and said, I'm going to build one called the First Church of Jesus. So they decided to build three church buildings. As soon as they came down, they were going to tell everybody they are going to go back over and build three big church buildings to commemorate what they had seen while they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And lo and behold, they got so fascinated with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and so fascinated with what they heard from heaven about this beloved son in whom God was well pleased that when they came down from the mount it says they saw no man save Jesus only. So you just get a little glimpse of Jesus and you get a little glimpse of his glory and listen to what God says about this beloved son and somehow you begin losing interest in everything else around it. I was thinking today about the woman in John 8 that was that was taken in adultery. And the Pharisees, uh, they're kind of spiritual bounty hunters, you know, and they went out and, and found this poor woman and they brought her to Jesus and really they didn't care about the woman. It wasn't so much that they really cared about the law. What they really cared about was to embarrass the Lord. And so they brought this poor woman and they said, look, this woman was, was caught in a very act of adultery. Now what do you think we should do with her? Jesus stooped down and he wrote something in the dirt. And he got back up and they were still bugging him for an answer. And uh, finally he said, after they had said the law says we should stone her, he said, all right. And then let him that's without sin cast the first stone. And so the Pharisees, it says, convicted by their conscience, one by one, they left. And some of these stories in the Bible are so real. They're so, they're so precious. They just ring of such truth that there's times when I read them I could almost imagine that I'm there and I could see this woman. She's been down there on the ground because he got down beside of her and wrote in the dirt so others could see what he had written. You know what he wrote, don't you? Everybody knows what he wrote. The Pharisees all know what he wrote because as soon as they read it, they left the country. But I, I see this woman down there and she doesn't even dare to look up. She's like the poor man that was taken in the temple. He dared not even cast his eyes toward heaven, but just cried out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And after everyone is gone, he says to her, Woman, where are thine accusers? And she said, I have none, Lord. He said, Neither do I accuse thee. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And I've always imagined right at that point that she looked up She'd been looking down. <laughs> She'd been looking down at the ground and been looking in her own heart and looking at her sin and looking at the accusations that had been made against her and now she looks up to Jesus and she's able to go and sin no more. That's something of this divine principle I'm talking about. When you, when you look at Jesus, everything kind of loses its importance. I don't care how many weights you've got, He can help you lay them aside. Sin of unbelief has overtaken you. Confess that sin to Him. He'll help you to put it away. And above all, whatever you lack, whatever you need, He'll give you. I can do what? All things through Christ which strengthens me. Apart from Him, I can do what? Nothing. I have my own version of that verse. I quoted it one time to myself, Apart from Thee, I can't even tie my shoestrings in the morning. I can't even remember how to tie my tie or get my shoes on or get out of bed or do anything else that I have to do every day. I can't do anything apart from Him, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me if I look to Him and look away from those things that have distracted me. Let's pray. Father, thank You tonight for what has encouraged our own heart at least, and we pray that it has also been used to encourage the hearts of those who are here. Father, help us to help us to continually look to the testimonies of others who have run their race and be encouraged by the fact that these common men made it and we can make it too. Let us be encouraged, Father, by the other runners around us and let us seek to encourage those who run with us. Help us not to put a stumbling block in any brother or sister's way and help us not to be a stumbling block to any brother or sister. But above all, Father, we'd ask that you'd help us to look to Jesus. This seems to be the hardest part of all because the fallen nature of man just... He's so rebellious against looking to Jesus. He just loves to look to himself and see if he can't find some way within himself to handle the race of life. 
But Father, we know that you allow us to be continually broken, continually tempted, continually crushed, humiliated. We have to confess that many times you allow the clouds of darkness to come upon us so we might have a good look at what we really are so that we may be driven to see Jesus. Help us to look to him tonight. Thank you for each of these brothers and sisters who came tonight. We love each one of them in a very special way because you love them and because you've loved us and because Jesus gave us commandment. We thank you now for this hour and for all that's been accomplished. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.